today. Welcome to the Chef's Pantry. I am Anna, and you are in a live cooking show. So wish us luck. You're in good hands, though. So I am so excited for today. We are headed over to Hyde Park, uh, which is just a few miles outside of Boston proper to a true Italian neighborhood gym. It's called Antonio's Bacari. And we are cooking with Chef Anthony Haley. Not only is he executive chef at this great Italian restaurant, but he's also a teacher at the Cambridge School of Culinary Arts. So we're in really good hands. And this is a great opportunity for you guys to chime in your questions and become experts in one of my absolute favorite pasta dishes, carbonara. And I'll try not to do a fish called Wanda. Uh, 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 carbonara. And if you know what I'm doing, I love you. And if you don't, go watch the movie immediately. So let's head over and meet Anthony. Chef, ciao. Hi, Anna, how are you? I'm how so good. Everything's good. So paint the picture for us. I love so much about this and we haven't even gotten into the pasta. Where are you right now? I am in my mother's house. Uh, she let me borrow her kitchen today because the restaurant's open. It's gonna be a little loud, a little dirtier in there. It's a beautiful kitchen. They just redid it. So I thought we'd go live here. And one of the things that's so special about Antonio's is that it is an Italian neighborhood restaurant and you're in the hood. You grew up like a stone's throw, right? Yeah, I'm from, I grew up here in West Roxbury and then I ended up leaving, going to college in um, Providence at Johnson & Wales University. I traveled to Florida, I traveled to Pennsylvania and I worked downtown for a long time and I ended up just coming right back to High Park, West Roxbury area, five minutes from home. So I haven't left, I mean, I left, but I'm back and I don't plan on leaving. <laughs> so it's good for me. Everybody I've seen from growing up, they come to the restaurant and people are just locals. It's just, it's fantastic. You know, it's such a homey little family place. And and I'm really excited. You've had a lot of opportunity to stretch your culinary chops there. What are some of the things on the menu that make it really special? Um, well, basically what happened was I was working downtown and the owner came to me and asked me if I wanted to open up a restaurant with him. And I thought he was crazy. But after a while of asking me, he was like, listen, we'll go to Italy and I just want you to eat your way through. And then from there, figure out how you want to present this menu and we can bring it back home to Boston. So I just kind of was like, all right. So every time we went out to eat, we started in Bergamo and we drove to Venice, Bologna. We went to Modena and then um, we stayed in Verona. Every single meal I had, I wrote it down. I took pictures and I was like, wow, it inspired me to create my own version. And that's pretty much everything on the menu here. And then everything else just kind of fell into place. This is like Stanley Tucci searching for Italy ground zero, what Joe did for you. Yes, pretty much. It's like the it happened way before. So Stanley Tucci took my idea, I guess. But my grandmother talks about that show. She just told me about it earlier. She's actually here. She's supporting me today, making sure. And she's going to make sure that uh, carbonara tastes good. But, uh, was, you know, she started me out in the cooking when I was a kid. I actually grew up in this kitchen, eating on this table. It was a lot older looking back then, the green fuzzy carpets and the, the plastic uh, covered carpets, you know? You know what I'm talking about? Yeah, so we used to have like those plastic covers on the ground that you wouldn't ruin the carpets, but I would flip them over so the spikes would come out and then chase my grandma and she'd run them off, so. <laughs> I married into an Italian American family, so I think I know what you're talking about. Yeah, but I think that we have a live studio audience. So let's get the pans fired up. I love carbonara. Um, what do we need to do first? And and I can't wait to learn from you how you make it right. Awesome. So uh, first thing I'm gonna do, I'm just gonna get my apron on. Like I said, I'm dealing with what I have at my grandmother's house. So we're gonna start with this beautiful apron and then all her pans and her tools. Um, but first thing I'm going to roll with is the pasta water. So I have about a pan here or a pot. We're going to start with a pasta, about six quarts of water just coming to a rolling boil. Now, for home, for the carbonara, you can use fresh pasta or you can use dry pasta, but I prefer the fresh pasta. It just has that much better, yeah, exactly, exactly. So it has a much better texture. It has a much better flavor. Um, I have Kitara today. I kind of went with what looked good, um, but like a spaghetti, even uh, like a linguine, like anything long and stringy that will really grip on to that great sauce that we're going to build. Is, is exactly. Great. Any kind of long noodle, anything with like a lot of surface area with a lot of volume is the best application for this kind of dish. 
Because what we're going to do is we're going to create the sauce outside of the heat. So the first thing we're going to do, just to get started, and we can keep talking, is we're going to start rendering our pancetta. Okay. Great. So in a pan, like a low, a lower pan, like uh, like this, not too bad, uh, not too shallow or, or thick. We're just going to throw in a little bit of our pancetta here. It's uh, chopped up. I already diced it, like quarter inch by a quarter inch. And you just want to put enough to kind of coat the bottom of the pan. Um, what we want to do is we want to render it. Usually when people have, um, they render bacon or fat, uh, baked kind of pork, they will do it on the heat directly. But we're going to add a little bit of water. So we're just going to cover the water, uh, cover our pancetta in the water. And what this does is as the pancetta boils in the water, it's going to help release a lot of the fat and render it out without actually burning the pancetta itself. So we're going to have a really crispy product rather than something that's crispy on the outside and it's a little soft and fatty in the middle. I, a little like that from, it, oh. I like that it helps um, keep it from spattering also. So I saw this trend with boiling bacon on TikTok and then I tried it. And like, I think it's really great also for expediting too. So you get the texture and the control. It's not as messy. And um and it's kind of fun. It's what what the what the cool kids are doing. So I, why do you? Do, so well, let's back up. Carbonara, super simple, easy ingredients that keep well in your pantry. So we have the, the spaghetti, uh, egg, butter, cheese, pepper, and then the meat. So it's just, it's so it's so simple, and that's why the quality of ingredients is so important. Why do you like using pancetta? Um, so in Italy, traditionally what they use, they use cured meats, but they'll use the guanciale, um, which is the jowl of the pig. So it's a very robust flavor. Um, I like to use pancetta because it's somewhere in the middle, which means guanciale, which is extremely robust, something more uh, acceptable here in the States of bacon. So pancetta is a non-smoked cured bacon, basically. Um, it has a really better crisp up, and it comes in like a log because instead of a uh, cut like the flat pork belly and then they slice it for bacon. They'll roll it up and cure it. And then we can cut it into bigger chunks from there. Um, I love the flavor of pancetta. Uh, the guanciale is, ex it's unbelievably delicious as well, but the flavor is just way more robust. And what we really want to do is focus the flavor on the pasta and the cheese. Great. Okay. And okay. So we have, so this is, what do we want to do? Bring it to like a low simmer. And so we're basically going to boil all the pinch out of here until so you'll, you'll notice that just turn up on high heat, just kind of swirl it around a little bit in there. And as uh, the water will boil, the fat will release from the pancetta, and then eventually the water is going to evaporate, leaving just the fat, and then it'll uh, render out and become super crispy. It goes cool. from zero to 60 very fast. Yes, yeah, oh, so that's that perfect. So the water is still in the pan. And it'll take about 10 minutes or things like that. But I figured since because um, everything else is going to be so simple that if we can kind of talk about, um, you know, like the history of it and the different ingredients we have and things like that. If you have any questions and at the end, it'll take maybe one minute to complete the dish because yeah. we're actually going to cook it with the heat from the pasta. It's just going to temper the eggs and make it super creamy without adding any cream. It's like a magic trick, isn't it? Because it has that mouthfeel of something that you make with loads of heavy cream. But just the art of emulsifying and whisking at the end too is so fantastic. Okay, so I, I am rocking and rolling with my pancetta. Did, did you, you tell turn me it around just a little bit? I dropped the heat a little bit. No, you can keep the heat up, but just make sure you kind of stir it up uh, so they don't stick together. Um, okay. But it, if you're if you're making a big batch, it doesn't really matter. Um, you can literally boil as much pancetta as you want, and it'll render down nicely. Um, after it's done, we're just going to strain it. So if you have a little strainer in a bowl, we can pour the pancetta into. That way we can re uh, remove the oil. Okay, perfect. Is your water boiling, Anna, for your pasta? Yeah, my water is boiling. Awesome. So, and then, <laughs> okay. so pretty much the carbonara is it's one of my favorite dishes because it's so simple. There's only It depends on where you go, but it originated in the Rome area of Italy, um, in Lazio. Um, and what it means is, is uh, carbonara is just the pasta that was eaten by the charcoal workers who would work in like the mines or, or who, who just like the hard blue collar workers. 
and they would take their cured meats, which was very plentiful, and just butter and cheese and egg yolks, and they would create their own dinner. Um, so just very simple, but extremely popular. Um, so what we want to do is just make sure that since we have minimal amount of ingredients, that they're the top quality that we can grab. So of course, we'll start with our butter. Um, I like to use unsalted butter in all of my recipes because whenever you cook, you want to make sure that you can season to your liking. And if you use salted butter, there's a good chance that maybe uh, towards the end, you have too much salt. So if you just want to slice these into little slices, I, I, I do like tablespoon knobs. Um, okay. We're going to use about three for one portion. I know it's a lot of butter, but butter's my favorite food. I don't eat it off the stick. When I say that, people are like, butter's your favorite food, but you know what I mean. I mean, it goes on everything. You put it in your coffee, you put it on toast. I mean, I cook with everything with butter. Um, it's just, it's one of those things that if you're going to cook something great, you got to make sure you use butter. And well, I have eaten a stick of butter before. It was Plaisé Dante butter when I studied abroad in France. I couldn't believe it when I woke up the next day. The stick oh, was well, gone. <laughs> I would love to have some fresh butter from France. It's one of my favorite foods too. Okay, do you have a brand that you really prefer? Um, I just like Cabot. I mean, it's just a, like Vermont butter, but uh, it's kind of a more of a smooth pack. Um, you know, sometimes the butter can like when you cut it, it'll break up into little shards. That's, that's um, it depends on how they make it. Um, but Usually, I spend a little bit extra money on the higher brand of raw butter. Great. Um, our pancetta is actually, um, I used to get the guanciale from Italy, but since, you know, I like to bring it in the middle, our pancetta is locally from Rhode Island and Danielle. Just, um, but when I do order the, the guanciale, um, I do get it from a good friend of mine, Fabio, from Pure Italian out in Watertown, their distribution center. Um, they do extremely high-end, authentic, and certified Italian products. Uh, mm -hmm. Fabio is a native Italian and he goes there all the time and he brings back and he'll call me and be like, I have this really great uh, cheese. I have this really great um, grains or, or cured meats. They have amazing products. So he hooks me up with all of my cheese at our restaurant. Those are um, friends our, you want to have. <laughs> I know. That's, that's what I'm saying. I like to have you. I have a, a, an Italian product guy. I have a mechanic. I kind of have an accountant and I have a florist. <laughs> As long as you have a guanciale guy, you are good to go, my yes. friend. Yeah, and you, you, you don't okay, really make so, it so you have so, a meat guy. So you're cooking with, I like this, the Rhode Island domestic pancetta. Sometimes you can taste a little bit of flavor difference, but I bet when you render it down like that, it's probably pretty hard to tell the difference. Yeah, it's, so, it's how the technique is. We're just going to crisp it up really nice, and then it won't have like a any sort of... Um, but that soft fattiness, if you don't render properly, you'll get more of that swiney flavor or that porky flavor. But since we're going to completely render it and it's going to be very, very crispy, we're going to have that really salty, really crunchy, and kind of like that smoky flavor. Even though there's no smoke, but we're going to, it's going to crispy up uh, real nicely. Um, also with the pasta, because we're not, we're using the saltiness from the pancetta and the saltiness from the pecorino romano, we're not going to add any salt to our dish. Okay. Salt is all there. Great. We are only going to add uh, ground black pepper. So traditionally, like I toast our pep um, my peppercorns, and just till they're fragrant, we can grind them in a mortar and pestle. Or if you don't have one of those, we, you can use a blender or a spice grinder. Um, so I did that ahead of time here because my poor grandmother doesn't have a spice grinder yet. So I'm going to have to put that on her gift list. So uh, I'll write that down. Um, I heard somewhere in like the different provenances of carbonara and like what you were saying of like the coal miners and like um, the, the charcoal provenance that the specks of pepper were also symbolic of like the specks of charcoal that would come off, you know, while they were eating. I, I thought it was kind of like a fun like wives tale. Yeah, I, I mean, I've heard multiple stories about carbonara. Um, some people believe that it's not from the charcoal. It's from a restaurant in, that was called Carbonara's in Rome that actually created the recipe. There's a bunch of different rumors, and you know how they spread. But I think the charcoal uh, story is the one that we're going to take today. We're, so. we're going to go with it. Yeah, I like that. We'll, we'll let them know. Um, so our pancetta, I don't know how yours is doing, but mine's uh, starting to reduce some of the water. We're getting close to being evaporated. And when all the water's evaporated, then we're going to really start to uh, – crisp up and will be done really quickly. So it looks like uh, almost like a translucent onion when you're sauteing it. But this is like, you know, like some of the dices of the pancetta are fattier than others. What, do we, 
how, how, what do I do? Do I just let it Leave it. You're going to have some bites that are less fat, and you're going to have some bites with more fat that are much better tasting. It's okay. all going to crisp up, and it, it'll all come together well. Some of them okay. are really, really meaty with a little bit more crunch, and the other ones will kind of explode with the flavor. Okay, cool. I mean, it's going to be really good. Now, the, believe it or not, the pancetta is just kind of, kind of uh, it's going to be like a garnish. It's going to be like an accent. Like okay. I said, the real star of the show is the spaghetti. Great. So we have some fresh spaghetti here. We just want to dress it up and make it look pretty. We don't want to overpower with anything. Um, all of my pasta I get freshly made from uh, Maria's in, in Medford. Uh, Malden, I'm sorry. Um, extremely close relationship with them as well. Um, they've been making my pasta since 2016, and I love it. Uh, it's so much better than using uh, dry pasta. You can use different types of spaghetti. You can use a thin spaghetti. A little bit thicker would be like spaghettoni. You can go really thick, which is like a bagoli. Um, I like to use that a lot in our restaurant. Um, I use it for like a shrimp dish. Um, and then you can also use tagliatelle or tappardelle. Any kind of long noodle will work really well with this kind of sauce. Mm. I try to stay away from the smaller things like the penne or the gnocchi or the rigatoni because the smaller surface area and the smaller volume, it won't stick as well. So you want to have some good texture for the sauce to cling on to. Are you exactly. going to drop? Are you dropping your pasta? Um, not yet. I'm actually just still waiting on the uh, the pancetta. The pasta is going to be pretty much our last thing. So, like okay. I said, we're we're gonna. So you, know what, you know what I have? Have you ever used one of these kitaras? Yes, I yeah. have. So at school, I teach class, I teach uh, recreational classes at the Cambridge School of Culinary Arts. And one of my favorites is the pasta workshop. And we have all these different tools, and one of them is the guitar, which we you can use to put the pasta on. You can mm -hmm. roll it through, making small, thin spaghettis. You can even put little squares on and roll it around a stick and, and gently press it, making a nice indented ziti or something similar to that. Um, they have tons of different tools, and they're all fun to play with, but that that's beautiful. What'd so you get, though? We did, uh, my husband and I did a, a culinary experience in Abruzzo. And so this was one of the, like the style that we made. And I, when I see this for fresh pasta, the Kitara pasta, I love grabbing it because instead of the round spaghetti, it has like the square edge that comes from pressing on the, the little grate. And it's fun to roll. You kind of get your rhythm. Yeah, it's a different texture because it's kind of sharp. It's not just like a round noodle. It has like a little edge to it, which I love. Right. All okay. right. So we're starting to, all my water's gone. I don't know about yours, but yeah, my, here. mine is mine is almost done. I think I had a little more of a generous pour, but should I go ahead and strain it off? And oh, you're good. I would just keep in? going. The water's going to leave. And then we don't, oh, yep, it's going to evaporate. Just, uh, and then it's going to start crisping up. Okay. Now, I guess right now we can start getting the rest of our prep ready. If you already want to uh, we can separate our eggs, we can uh, grate our cheese, and then we're almost we're almost ready to start plating after Great. that. Um, okay, tell so, us about the eggs. Sure. So I'm going to use about two egg yolks. Just, that's it for uh, a carbonara. I don't like to use whole eggs. Some people like to use whole eggs. I think that's a little uh, crazy because you're not really going um, the, the traditional way. So... I mean, we're just going to crack them. That's a perfect way to separate them. I like to use my hands, but since I'm not really in the okay. kitchen at work, that's how I'm going to do that. But I like Can to smash really them together. Show me. Now we're going to save the egg whites for whatever. Um, my mom makes a really good lemon meringue pie, so I'll leave them for her or put them in her egg, egg omelets or anything like that. But I like to separate the egg yolks. Just by going back and forth, you just got to be a little careful because sometimes if you do it that way, you can break the yolk by the um, sharp edge of the uh, shell. Right. So the, fir the first egg I always smash together. No matter how you smash them, only one's going to break. I don't know how that works, but I like to tell people that. It's a little fun little fact. It's then, like the, the Darwinism of the, uh, of, of the, the shells. Okay, so... Um, so I pulled aside three yolks. Sure, we can do three. We can do two. It's just okay. as we pour, as we put it in there, we're gonna start cooking with our eyes. 
I don't tend to use recipes a lot. I like to use the technique and, the, and taste it and then use my eyes and we can kind of build it from there. So if you, we can do that with, here, I, and I'll help you guide you through. Um, so my pancetta is starting to crisp up. It's starting to brown very nicely. I'm going to put that on that little camera right there. You can see all my water is evaporated and all that liquid is just leftover fat. So now the pretty much all the fat from really deep inside of the pancetta slices or, or dices is released. And now we're really starting to crisp up nice. I think uh, I did this earlier just to kind of see if it would, uh, you know, I want to make sure it would work in this kitchen because I don't work here that often, but it came out perfectly. So I'm really excited. And I think we're going to like this little method of uh, crisping up pancetta. Um, so, so it's becoming I'm very gonna... aromatic. It smells amazing. Oh, is that your fire alarm? Is that my fire alarm? <laughs> no, that's that's over here. I took them down, but we forgot one. <laughs> oh, okay. It... Yeah, we're good. It's all right. It was just it was just the neighbor. He actually, my stepdad just took it and he just ran out with it. So <laughs> pretty good. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks, Dad. So, okay. Uh, have we talked about the pecorino yet? No. So we'll talk about the pecorino. I love this. This is my favorite pecorino romano that I've had ever. Um, no! I, oh, real quick, my pancetta is all set, so I'm gonna shut that off. So I'm just gonna really quick before we talk about. Oh, yours went off as well. Yeah. Perfect. Okay, we're doing something right. I'm not the only one then. All right, great. <laughs> Okay, Pecorino. Pecorino. Okay, so Pecorino Romano is a sheep's milk cheese. It's a hard cheese. Um, sheep's milk, it literally means of a sheep, I think, in Italian, right? I don't know. Pecorino. Like, yes. like, a, like a U, pe Pecorina. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Exactly. So this cheese is extremely salty. Now, I get this from Pure Italian, my buddy Fabio. Um, it's DOP, so it's protected from the region. So it's made that the uh, pasta... Um, and the cheese, where it comes from, you know, they want to make sure that it's properly uh, certified. So this yeah. comes from, uh, Pul I think, Puglia, but Pecorino originates from Lazio and is a sheep's milk. It's very salty and it's aged for 12 months. Hmm. The older the age, the more umami, the more flavor you have, and the age makes all the difference. So I don't know how many months yours was, um, but this is a 12 month, a one year hmm. Romano cheese. This is my favorite. Any more than that, and you get a little bit more, um, you get more flavor, but it'll be a little more harsh. And we want to keep our carbonara on the simple side. Yeah, I think my, I went to Italy um, on Friday and I picked it up there, but mine tastes young. It's not quite as like dry and crumbly as some of the pecorinos are. And pecor, was it pecor? You can get Romano, but that's pecorino Romano is the imported cheese yes. which can be it has bigger flavor which i love i love that tanginess that you get it almost makes my tongue tingle yeah it, it kind of burns and that's yeah. it, it's pretty much it's, it's what the flavor is so, so what, what happens is at a biological level i guess or science wise the uh, proteins in the milk and the cheese are broken down to the amino acids and the amino acids are what creates that flavor and that like fermentation and like what makes everything um umami as you would say and like a lot of foods that, that extra sense of uh, taste so um yeah this cheese is extremely great it's really it's a hard cheese and i like to grate it right off of the uh the block we get these 50 pound blocks and i didn't want to bring the whole thing so i took a big chunk off <laughs> so do you have a grater oh, I, your, I, look, look what i've done this is how fine mine is mine's like oh, wow, that's great. the lighter it is the better because what we yeah. want to do is we want it to melt inside of the pasta and it, so it's like snow. Oh, it looks great. Yeah. Like, right. Yeah. Micro planer. Oh, but, yeah. But, I have a micro planer too. Real uh, quick, I don't need to right fire chef. You got to help me out for a sec. The pancetta, should I put it on a paper towel to wick away the extra fat so it stays crispy? Yeah, sure. If I, I would put that paper towel over a bowl so all that extra fat will drip through in your bowl. But it's okay. I won't tell anybody. <laughs> no one, no one can look. Guys, there's nothing to see here. Okay, and you're going to shred your pecorino so it becomes really feathery. So if you were as a, a teacher at Cambridge School of Culinary Arts, what do you say is, like, what do you recommend if someone wants to become a really good cook that they learn first? Um. Well, obviously, the first skill that I would uh, recommend is knife skills. Um. 
at the school, um, Cambridge School of Culinary Arts is an incredible institution. Um, it's been highly acclaimed among the nation's premier culinary schools. It's been around for 45 years, founded in 1974. And the recreational classes, we provide a uh, technique series. So it would be a six week series for your home cook who from all skill levels. So you can start out with our first class would be knife skills. Basically, this is a knife. This is how you hold a knife. And we cut vegetables, we'll cut onions, we'll cut parsley or herbs and things like that. Just get them comfortable with working on a cutting board, working with their knives and kind of organizing their mise en place. And then as classes go on, a week later, a week later, they get a little more advanced. So our second class would be eggs. You're not another basic uh, technique. You know, you can cook an egg a hundred different ways. They say that the hundred toques on a chef's coat is from the hundred different ways that you can cook an egg. So we'll do souffles to omelets and we'll do hollandaise sauce, things like that. And then they get more advanced and we'll do soups and stocks and sauces. We'll dry cooking methods such as grilling, frying and baking. We'll do moist in combination with braising and stewing. And then we'll end the, the series with some master sauces, talk about the mother sauces. Mm -hmm. And we'll kind of wrap up everything we did for the six weeks. Um, it's fantastic. I love that. It's, it's amazing because I love the passion of people that actually want to cook. Because as a chef working in restaurants for so long, the majority of the people that I've been cooking, uh, teaching to cook, mostly do it for a paycheck. So for someone to come in with the passion of wanting to learn, and they're sitting there and they're interested in why it tastes like this, why does it work like that, why does this happen, that really gets me going, that really makes me invest in that. And it's just, it makes it fun for me. So I can do that for six hours and then go work at the restaurant for another 10 and somehow manage to stay sane. Um, I, turn with you. I, we, my husband and I love the, the Cambridge School of Culinary Arts. We would actually celebrate our first wedding anniversary <laughs> couple class there as part. I think we like made like a, a pork chop feast um, in one of one of the programs, like the day programs, and it's right. fantastic. Okay, so I have my water back at a slow boil. All right, we're ready to go. So why don't you drop I have your my pasta? warm here. Yeah, I. So Ready to? Am I am I ready to pull it all together? Yeah, we're ready. We're gonna drop our pasta in the pot. We're gonna have one pan here, and we're gonna slowly just kind of melt some butter, three tablespoons of butter. We're not gonna cook with the butter. We just want to melt it for the flavor. So you can throw that in the pan there with a little bit of heat. And let's see how this. Hey, how this works? Oh, perfect. There we go. And then we'll add our pancetta. So I like to use maybe for one person. About a tablespoon and a half. This has already been rendered. We'll throw that right in the butter. In the butter. Great. Cool. Okay. Like I said, we're just going to melt the butter because what we want to do is we want to coat our pasta with the uh, with the butter in the pan. So. Okay. So. My pasta, my fresh pasta takes about one to two minutes to cook. It's a lot faster than your dry pasta. Just kind of swish it around there so they don't stick together. Nice. Okay, so my butter's melted nice here. My pancetta is extremely crispy. And then going on a nice and steady low temperature too, it keeps the butter from separating. Well, it keeps it from burning because we don't want to burn the milk solids in the butter. We just kind of want to melt it because when we when we coat the um the pasta, it's gonna make give us that mouthfeel. Great. So I'm, I'm all set with my butter and my pancetta. So here is. My, my basic pan, um, and I'm ready to build. So all I'm gonna do is toss my pasta into the butter. No egg yet. No egg yet. We're actually gonna cook the egg off the heat. Great. So I'm straining my pasta here, and it's gonna go right into the butter. I don't think my pasta's done. Try not to get any extra um, water from your pasta in there. That'll just kind of um, change the sauce a little bit, but it'll still be delicious. My pasta needs another water. Okay. All right, so now we're going to start building. That you had in Italy? Oh, carbonara was the first dish I had in Venice, and I thought it was crazy how simple it was. So, so now that our pasta is extremely hot, we want to temper it. We're going to cool it down with the cheese. So we're just going to put a, little, a cup of cheese or a half a cup. I'm sorry, kind of coat it, and we're going to toss the cheese in it. Now that brings the temperature of the pasta down, so when we add our eggs, they don't scramble. <coughs> So now I have my pasta with the cheese, and I'm going to pour in my egg yolk, and I'm going to move it around. That's it. 
We're going to work it. We're going to temper it. And that heat from the pasta is enough to cook the egg yolks and uh, make it nice and creamy without scrambling it or anything like that. Ooh, okay, can you nice. give like a fistful of, of the pecorino? Yeah, about a half a cup, enough to coat all the pasta. <laughs> I'm trying to imitate you with chefy stuff and it, I'm like, I'm like wishing that there was a cleaning crew that came in besides me after this. This is I like it. That's how, you, that's how it starts. Okay, wait, and then yolk? The yolks go in so you can toss them right into your pasta. Okay. Yeah, and then keep, you want to swirl around. If you can use your tongs, you want to mix those yolks in. The heat from your pasta is going to really cook the yolks slowly enough to not scramble them. Okay. Okay, this is where, right, there the culinary go. teacher. Okay, okay, this looks really good. That looks good. I need, I need my, I need my tongue. I need to take your class on, on pan tossing. Oh, Absolutely. No. I'll, I'll put you on the waiting list. Because that's my <laughs> class, the hand tossing class. Okay, so this is one of the dishes that you serve, correct, for your meals to go? Uh, correct. So we do an El Paco program. So we do a double portion of uh, pasta with a salad um, for $29. And it's kind of been helping out with the COVID situation. And it's been really helping the neighborhood. And it's been helping us as a restaurant. Our carbonara is our best selling uh, item, even though it's a primo. So it's kind of like in between an appetizer and a main entree. But most people order it as an appetizer or an entree. So it, it fits perfectly everywhere in the menu. So I would think of carbonara as something that you have to eat immediately from the pan to the table. What's your trick when you do the to-go? And it might be like 45 minutes before somebody's sitting down at their table and eating it. So to-go, we just add a little bit of extra moisture. So we'll put an extra tab of butter in there. And that'll just kind of keep it a little wet and keep it from drying up while it's in the container. But also because it's in the, um, the steam, it's warm, it, it doesn't stay too dry. If it was uncovered, that's when it would really dry up. So your pasta looks great. You can put that on a plate right now. Okay. I oh, got that looks, it. Yeah, that looks good. You can put that right on a plate. I put it on a nice white plate here. And then we're pretty much done. We're just going to garnish it with a little bit more of the pecorino right on top. And it gives it that beautiful color. And then, like I said, the only real garnish we need is the freshly ground pepper. And I like to put that on the rim around here a little bit and a little bit on top. And, and that's the carbonara. Very, very simple. Look no, at that. All right, my grandmother's going to taste it for us, and then you let me know, Anna, what you think about it. Okay, Anthony. Is, is Noni going to give her stamp of approval? Well, I hope so. She's 94 <laughs> years old. 94. Oh, it's, so, it's so wonderful to see you. How fun to see your grandson whipping up a delicious meal. Delicious. Like <laughs> you got to get your glass of wine. All right. Oh, she took it. I'll pour a little glass of Pinot Grigio. Um, this looks fantastic. And I love that every ingredient that you put in here has a purpose and a reason. Oh, I forgot my pen. Delicious. Oh, that's the best part. That's the best part. That little pop right there. Mmm. Okay. Mm. Yeah, taste it. Mm. Mm. Good, huh? Oh, man. Very good. What do you think, Anna? It's delicious. And it's so beautiful seeing you two <laughs> slurping the, the pasta together. I mean, this, if, if we can't be on Stanley Tucci's heels right now, and we just have to live vicariously, this recipe is the next best thing. This is amazing. And I love that we can get it as a meal to go, thanks to your delicious takeout. Jeff, it's such a pleasure. Noni, thank you so much for joining the studio audience. With <laughs> Just take it as a go. <laughs> That's, that means you did it right. <laughs> Cheers, chef. Thank you so much. Cheers. Salute. Salute. Manja, manja. Mm. Manja. Oh, this is so good. And th this, I did I damage in here today. Got to reinstall the smoke alarm and get a wipe down service. Um, thank you so much, chef.
Thank you guys. I love seeing the Noni fans out there. Um, and thanks for, for chiming in and cooking with us. Uh, we'll be back next Monday in the chef's pantry. In the meantime, we have mom to mom on Wednesday with Maria Sansone and the Hub Today weekend on Saturday and Sunday. Eat well, enjoy life, and let's travel, if not in real life on an airplane, then with delicious food.